latest. Holly's hot spurs back with another one. Chatting all things Tottenham, we're second to none. Special guests every time, if it's win, lose, or draw. The passion is high, like Harry Kane when he scores. Or when Lloris makes a world class save. We got Hoybier running the mid every game. Settle down, stick around, say your thoughts with the panel. And make sure you're subscribing to the channel. Coys. Hello and welcome to another episode of Holly Spurs Live, where tonight things are a little different because I am joined by a very special guest. When I started the show, I was really, I really wanted to get someone on that I've watched play as a kid, and that is Stephen Corker. I am so honoured to have you on, my friends. How are you tonight? Thank you. No, it's nice to be here. I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Like I said, I'm, I'm a little bit stressed to have you in my presence, um, but hopefully it'll be a good show for everybody to watch and dissect. Yeah, no, 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 certainly. Again, apologies for, for leaving it to the last minute to join the call. Uh, no, I know you're stressing a little bit, so apologies for that. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. No worries. But let's crack on with it, because obviously we're here to talk about your career and everything you're doing recently. So if everybody didn't know, obviously, Stephen has played for Spurs, uh, hence why he's here also. He's played for Swansea, QPR, Saints, Liverpool, and more recently, Wigan. Um, so you started your young footballing career at Tottenham. Uh, what would you say it was like, obviously, going through the youth academy at Spurs? Well, I was fortunate because I, I came through with a lot of talented players, a lot. I mean, Ryan Mason, Harry Kane, Jake Nivermore, Danny Rose, Carl Walker. Well, I mean, the list goes on. Tom Carroll, Alex Pritchard. And there's probably a few that I've, I've missed there as well, um, who have all gone on to play international football, gone on to play Premier League football, League One, Championship, you know, but, it was an incredible, incredible sort of like few years for for Tottenham. Um, a lot of that was credit to you know John McDermott, Alex Zingerford, Chris Ramsey, who were sort of running the show, um, and they and they they created I think a really good environment. So I was fortunate coming through where I was with I was with players, like minded players who just wanted to be the best. You know that was that was the mentality. Um, today, when I work with a lot of youngsters, I kind of feel it may be slightly different, but the mentality back then, in particular in that youth team, was it was phenomenal. Like, the coaches would have to stop us from wanting to do three sessions a day. You know, it was it was intense. Mm, no, that is mental. And, like, when you were growing up, sort of thing, obviously, because you played centre-back, was there someone that you admired that were already at Spurs, or did you have another player in mind that you wanted to aspire to be, sort of thing? If I'm honest, right, I, I wanted to be Rio Ferdinand. When I when I turned to centre half, I wanted to be Rio Ferdinand. After I joined Spurs and I got to witness Ledley King firsthand, he for me, like hands down the best centre back that England have ever had. However, uh, obviously injuries like really played his career and um a lot of people outside of the, the, the Tottenham family don't recognise him as one of the best. I'm like for me he was the best. Mm -hmm. He was so, so talented. But um, and what was even more amazing was he was able to play and perform at the highest level whilst only training, you know, once a week. So um, he was someone that obviously once I got in and really actually saw it first time, he, he then became someone I aspired to, aspired to be like. I was say, because I think that's most people when they say, obviously, at the moment of our centre-back situation. But if I think of a centre-back, I think of Ledley King, even though he did at the end only have one knee. Um, he was incredible, uh, that man. And obviously... What was it like to to get to the point where you could sign your first professional contract? How does that kind of make you feel? Well, it kind of all came at once. So I'd, I'd been rejected by several teams um, as a youngster. So QPR, uh, Southampton, Reading, to name a few. And when I got signed by Tottenham, it all happened so fast. So um, I was actually still on trial at Southampton. Tottenham had given me a, a, a day. I, I came in, I trained, done quite well. It's right, come back on the Saturday. I turned up in the wrong boots. I had metal studs. I didn't realise, I didn't even know what 4G was to be honest with you. Like where I was playing Sunday league, you're playing on a, on a field, you know, you're cleaning up the dog poo before the, before the game kind <laughs> of thing. So then coming into Tottenham where you've got these facilities, it was a bit of a shock. Um, John McDermott actually lent me his boots that day. Oh, so wow. it kind of took all my <laughs> pressure off because I kind of just thought, if I don't play well today, yeah, it's, it's okay. Like I didn't have the correct boots on. So all the pressure had sort of left me and I was able to, you know, to obviously play a, a fairly decent game. And they, they then gave me that day um, a, a contract leading on to a scholarship. 
um, and it may even have included the pro contract or, or was about to include it. So um, it kind of, yeah, it's from, from 15, it just, everything just happened so, so quickly. Um, the day I actually signed um, was great. I, you know, I, I signed and I literally went straight on loan to Yeovil and started playing first team football. So um, yeah, that was a really, really good time for me. You know, looking back, did I take it for granted? Maybe a little bit. Um, I think we're always looking for the next step. So Yeovil, League One, okay, well, I want to go to Championship. After the Championship, I want to go to the Prem. And, mm-hmm. You know, it kind of, I guess, passed me by. But I think sitting here today, I definitely look back and go, wow, they, they were great memories. Because mm, I was going to obviously mention your time uh, in loans and things. And obviously, I think it was when you were at Yeovil, didn't you join uh, with, was Mason there as well at the time? Was he already there sort of thing? How did that kind of make you feel that you already knew someone there that you were going to go join? Yeah, so we actually went together. So John oh, wow. Abika was, yeah, John Abika was the one who was already there, and myself and Ryan went to, went to join him. So um, oh, for us, it was it was just like, firstly, like living away from sort of London, like where I'd grown up, and okay, I'd, I'd moved out at sixteen to go into Diggs, but I was still sort of like relatively close to home. So Yeovil kind of felt like a, a step away. Um, but yeah, working working with um, uh, Ryan John Abika. Uh, we had Nathan Jones there as assistant manager, Terry Skivens manager. Um, crazy, really, really, really good team. Um, don't know how the manager managed to assemble so many like players together, but we got Alex McCarthy, uh, Southampton now is mm-hmm. in goal. Sean McDonald, who was playing for Swansea and stuff like that. So, yeah, really good team. Um, and yeah, just I, I, so I, that that was my first taste of any football. That was probably the moment where I thought, wow, I've actually I, I'm onto something here. Mm. And like you said, obviously, about the, the fact you're always looking for the next step. Is that kind of what happened when you obviously came back and then went on loan to Bristol? Because was not was Danny Rose there at the time? Or was that the same sort of thing with Mason? You kind of went at the same time? Sort of thing? No, he was there before me. Yeah, he was there. So I came back. I made my debut for Tottenham in between this, which mm-hmm. I actually I actually didn't remember this. It's actually crazy. Only um, last week I've been moving house. So last week I was like going through all my old stuff. I had loads of shirts. And I was like, I had a shirt with like number 45 on with Tottenham and I was like what was that and then I was like wow that was that was my first ever game so Harry gave me the opportunity to play in a cup game against Arsenal um oh, wow. I remember it I just come back from an injury um I was I was nowhere near fit but the opportunity came you're not going to turn it down mm-hmm. and it was 1-1 um and then went into extra time and I I said to the to Harry like I can't move like I'm cramped all the adrenaline all that day all the nerves everything He's like, no, 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 you'll be fine. We ended up um, losing an extra time 4-1. I <laughs> gave away a penalty and I was like, oh my God. So I came away from the game, like, obviously a bit deflated, thinking, wow, like, how is, like, why? It was so good until 90 minutes and then it kind of <laughs> drifted away. But, um, but yeah, following on from that, I was sent on loan to Bristol City and, um, yeah, started started another journey, you know, in the championship, which, which um, again, was, was another really good experience. Mm. And I kind of feel these kind of experiences, obviously, I've played a lot lower than you have, but you kind of take them with you. And then obviously what happened with Bristol and then go back to Spurs, was that something that you kind of kept with you to propel you into your rest of your football career sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. Um, and as you mentioned before, like going like places where there were people, Ryan at Yeovil, um, Daddy Rose at Bristol City, that it really helped because I think it just helped you settle in, you know, like you've got someone there who's in the same situation as you, who, you know, a lot of the boys, they're obviously fighting for their mortgages. Like it's it's not as glamorous as what people think, you know, playing in League One and the championship. Um, the money's obviously good, but it's a short career and players are aware of that. So they're fighting for the next contract and, um, you know, they're sort of living sort of like month to month. Whereas obviously us as youngsters, we're looking for, for like the, the following season to be back at Tottenham. And like sort of working towards that, so we're slightly different goals. So having someone alongside me uh, with similar goals sort of like really helped. Um, and when I did go back to Tottenham the the following summer, I felt more prepared. I was I was obviously more experienced, and I'd I'd had that taste of of two years now of uh, playing first team football. Mm. And I guess, like you said, that definitely really helps having that on your back sort of thing that you've kind of been there with the first team. Now you're going to come back to Spurs with a bit more more ruggedness, so to speak. You, you've kind of been there. You've, you've done it in the lower leagues. And obviously you mentioned Harry Redknapp. And for me, Harry's probably one of my favourite managers. I just like saying his name, Harry. But um, with that, what could you kind of say? Is there many memorable moments with Harry? Harry is a very memorable character for me. So is there anything that you could share about Harry that you kind of learn from him? Um, God, it's a good question. How much did I learn from him? Um, I'll tell you what I learned from him. 
I learned from him uh, the PR side of football. That's what I learned from because I never really got to, to work under him in terms of training. So um, I never, I mean, I played that one game for him and I played one training session prior to that. So what did I learn from him? What I learned was was the PR side of football. So I remember we was going to, a, uh, we was called up to an England under 19 tournament and he pulled the four of us aside. I think it was me, Dean Parrott, um, John Bostock and another player, I can't remember the player was. And he said to us, look, like, I wouldn't recommend you go into this. You know, you, you need you, if you want to be a part of our squad, you need to come away pre-season with us. You need to be ready. Like, if you want a chance, this is your chance. And uh, me and Dean Parrott were like, no, nah, like, this opportunity to go and play for England, like, we're going to take it. And um, he was like, nah, that's, that's on you. But just so you know, when you come back, you're not going to have that chance or whatever, right? A day later, he was in the media saying... Um, how it's it's <laughs> how every player who's who should be who's called up for England no matter what age should be playing. Um, it's scandalous that players aren't playing. So those boys who decided to like stay and be with him, he's just like just said like how am I how am I to drive publicly? Obviously not behind closed doors, but publicly just saying like how like it's, it's scandalous if you call for England you should play. So that was a moment I remember going home talking to my dad about it like wow like he he told us not to go and then he said us everyone should go and I was like so that was kind of the moment like everyone knows <laughs> exactly everyone knows this stuff happens in football right everybody knows it I'm not saying something that uh, people wouldn't be aware of but uh, that was my first taste at, I don't know the age of 18 um, of like oh, okay like yeah there's there's two sides to every story uh, three sides if you like actually and um and yeah so I uh I, I, it, it helped me it helped me learn from a young age that you need to also be um quite switched on media wise um unfortunately I didn't learn it for many years but I it made me aware that I, I should should have learned yeah mm, no it's definitely I think like a tough lesson uh social media like you say like if you get someone and you have that kind of instance that you're kind of taught it then you're like, all right, okay, I can move forward with this. Um, but obviously, like we said, we said about Harry, um, and I also want to talk about the fact because obviously you did score some goals as well. It was two, but it's still two goals, like it's still goals. Um, yeah. so for you, how did you kind of feel when those footballs hit the back of the net for you? Well, the first one was mad because the first one, I don't know if you've seen it, mm. like um, or memory, I should say. Um, it was Jermaine Defoe, he shot. He, he shot wide, it hit my heel and went in. And I was like, wow, like of all the times. <laughs> like the, exactly. Like the season before, I was at Swansea and played a whole season in the Premier League. I did a good few headers, keeping us saving it left, right and centre. And then there, I turned my back, hit my heel and gone in. And I was like, I just remember saying to him, is that my goal? And he's like, yeah, that's your goal. <laughs> like, he's like, I wish it was mine because, you know, with him, he can never have enough. He always wanted more and more and more. And uh, obviously, he was a prolific goal scorer. Um, so I got that one. That was sort of my first one, which was just uh, pure luck, as far as I'm concerned. And then, um, and then I got the one against uh, Man City, which which was great. So I got the got the opener at Man City. We ended up losing the game two one, unfortunately. But that was like an amazing moment. We're away at the Etihad, and we've got one nil up, and, and I've scored it. And it, it's like, yeah, that 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 was, and I think still is pretty surreal, you know, looking back to to have experienced or sort of playing at that that level. Mm, definitely 100% and like you say like even if you say that that goal was like you have to be in the right place at the right time so that's something you can't teach you have to already yeah. have that um and obviously you yeah. mentioned your time at Swansea and the fact that that was obviously your kind of first real taste of say Premier League football apart from your obviously uh, appearance with Spurs in the cup how was how did you kind of feel obviously going into that season with that kind of would you say you had an expectation on your shoulder or would you say you just went in there and you thought I'm just gonna go with this and see how I do yeah, I just, I, I don't feel like I have, well, no, if I've been honest, I did have an expectation, but the expectation was what I put on myself. Mm -hmm. So I always believed that, um, I, I always believed I wasn't good enough. Um, I always believed that I should have been better. Uh, we could we could play in a game and win 3-0 and it's like, should have been four, should have scored. Um, if we win 3-2, I'm upset, didn't keep a clean sheet. You know, there's always something that I feel I could have done better at. Um, and, that, and that's just something I guess that I've struggled with in my life, like on and off the pitch. It's just sort of like self confidence and a lot of sort of like um, criticism and stuff like that myself. So when things went wrong in football, it was kind of like, wow, this is a difficult period because it was like, not only am I thinking it, people are now saying it to mm -hmm. me. Do you know what I mean? And that was kind of a challenge. But um, but I feel I feel obviously now I'm 31 and far more experienced. When I play today, I'm like, okay, you know what? like the expectation of myself is just to try my best that's my expectation like 
try my best uh, from you know seven days a week, give it my all, and what happens on the pitch happens. You know, I'm, I'm not in control of the 21 other players and and the refs and and VAR today. You know, there's there's so much out of of, of my control as a player. Mm, definitely, I think that's like you mentioned. I think. I think some of us all have that thing that we put on ourselves because I'm definitely one of those people that sit here and think I could always do better, I can always do more. But like you said, do you find that now obviously you've, you've kind of, like you said, you've learnt that. Is that something that you would say to younger players in a sense that grasp every moment as it comes but put your all into it sort of thing? Yeah, definitely. And and the, a big part of what I talk to, talk to young players about is actually like controlling what you can f- control. So a lot of times they're heading to games, as I've done and still do, you know, going, oh, well, I need to do this, I need to do that. I'm like, actually, I can't control, like my fantasy before the games, I'm going to run from the back, take on four players and, <laughs> and put it in top corner, right? That's my fantasy before the game. We've got to aim aim high. But the reality of the game is actually I might lose the first header, the first pass might get intercepted. They might score. I mean, if you looked at Man City the other day, they, they scored in the cup final after, what, 10 seconds or, or something ridiculous. So it's like like the idea that I have before in my head can, can easily easily change. And it's like I try to relay that message to a lot of like young players, like mm-hmm. take the pressure off, just control what you can control, how fast, how fast you run, how hard you run, how hard you tackle. These are all things within your control. Um, and I feel like just by giving sort of that, like simplifying it, um, the rest just comes naturally, you know, like the rest just literally takes care of itself. So uh, that's definitely the message I, I carry and I, I try to you know to share with, with many of the, the youth today. No, it's definitely a good one to take. Like you say, there's there's only so many things you can control. If you control what you can control, then like you said, the rest will kind of follow. Um, and obviously, I just want to take it back to Spurs because obviously you mentioned that Ledley King had a big influence on you when you came to Spurs. Is there anyone you played with at your time that you were like, oh, wow, like he's incredible sort of thing? Yes, I could tell you the name right now, <laughs> Moussa Dembele. He was just like, he was so, so, so good, right? And I don't know, like, why, like, he, he's known as, as being, like, that good because he was he was phenomenal. Like, he was so, so good. Like, even as a, as a, as a defender to play with, he was someone who constantly won the ball back. You can give him the ball with anyone, like, next to him. He's just, just had that huge legs, like, unbelievable. Sort of just, like, natural strength. And um, he was great. He was amazing to play with. I was fortunate enough to train with Luka Modric. Never got a chance oh, wow. to play with him, but obviously, just just incredible. Like for me, at the highest level, what what always what sort of separates, I guess, like the best of the best from like the rest of us is like their brain. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. how they think. And um, you know, a lot of people always ask me, like, oh, is it is it the speed? Is it the the technical ability? Um, I think it plays a part, right? Of course, it does. But I also see a lot of like talented talented players in terms of physically and and like technically but they haven't got the brain to go with it whereas mm-hmm. like Luka Modric using his example it was just even when I knew where he was going to pass the <laughs> weight of the pass just was that little bit too much so I still couldn't intercept it um and then obviously he's got on to just yeah, yeah like basically destroy football you know he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's done everything hasn't he done absolutely everything so um I never knew that at the time, training with him, what he was going to go on to achieve. But I definitely knew he was special, for sure. Mm. It's definitely the forward thinking, like you say. You can have all the talent, but if you haven't got it up here, then you're not going to be able to perform that pass. Um, Connor's just mentioned to me, now, Wes, that I have on most weeks, is Musa Dembele's biggest fan. And he will be buzzing that you said that about Musa, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, no, like you said, I think growing up watching Musa Dembele as well, just what he did with the football was just incredible. Um, yeah. And that being said, obviously, he's, like you said, with Musa, it, it's sad that I never got to see him play his testimonial at the new stadium, but I'm sure he'll be back yeah. with vengeance to be able to do that um yeah. obviously I want to talk a little bit about your international career because obviously you played a little bit for England before then you changed to Sierra Leone so what was it like first of all to be in the England camp would you say um yeah I, well, it was pretty nerve-wracking actually pretty nerve-wracking so when I first went there it was just kind of like wow like looking around obviously all the players that I'd sort of grown up watching and uh I felt nervous again like in, internally probably didn't feel worthy of being there um I settled in after a while. Um, it was still, it was quite like, it was quite different to what it is today. You know, like a lot of words for today, so it's, it's a lot more of a different environment. But back then it was kind of like, you had your dinner, people weren't really talking that much and mixing. So it was kind of like, it was a hard sort of environment to mm-hmm. step into. Uh, I know that's changed a lot today, especially under Gareth. And, and obviously they brought a lot of like, young players in and it's changed it. So that was kind of my, my sort of experience of, of being there day to day with England in the squads. But in terms of, playing um 
yeah, just incredible. Like got the got the opportunity to play, uh, make my debut, scored on my debut. Um, it was it's known as the Zlatan show. You know, he he took he did his bicycle kick and his other magic um, that game. So that's what it, it's a it's a game that people will never forget. Not not because of uh, my, uh, my my goal, but uh, because of Zlatan's I think four goals. I think he scored that game. So mm-hmm. yeah, definitely definitely like uh, just an incredible experience and one that you know I obviously look back on fondly. Mm, no, definitely. And, and like you said, I think, obviously, I've never been in an England camp, but like you said, I feel like it wasn't more like dog eat dog, but in a terms of like, it was more stressful in a terms that you've got to perform yeah. or you don't get your place. Whereas like you say today, it seems more of a chilled atmosphere. Because obviously, I don't know if your show's out yet. Forget me if I'm or make me if I'm wrong. But obviously, you interviewed Southgate recently. Um, is there any little like, little what can I say secrets that you could like poise out that you've you've spoken to him about or is it again the fact that that nature in that camp is so much more relaxed now yeah definitely so the the interview will be out soon with uh, behind the white lines and I mean I've been fortunate enough to interview quite a lot of like people in the last uh last six or seven months really where I've kind of like like started to look elsewhere at football and started to go okay well how can I make an impact off the pitch and what I wanted to to do was I mean, the, the name sort of says it for itself. It's like behind the white line. So what's the the human side of these footballers? You know, talking about Moussa Dembele, like the most humble player that I've played with, you know? Um, so not just a good player, like a really great human as well. And I, I kind of like, want to showcase more of that. Um, Harry being another example of that, you know, really, really good guy. And um, Gareth, for me, is the nicest manager I've ever come across. And getting the opportunity to sit down with him and, and have a conversation, deep conversation about you know, how does he handle the pressure as, as a manager, you know? So, um, and, and he openly admitted, you know, today he doesn't read the newspapers, you know, when he's in the squads, he just doesn't, you know, especially in camp and he's headed into the World Cup, heading into the Euros, he's like, I just don't look at the media because it just, it can just be too much. You know, any time he, he announces a squad, whatever squad he puts, it's all, it always should have been another squad. And it's mm-hmm. like, he just spoke about that. And I was like, it, you know, it just, it makes me think like, wow, imagine if I was England manager, like, how, how how would you deal with that? You know, any decision you make, it's criticised. You know, you've got Gary Neville, you've got Jamie Carragher, and uh, everyone's always got a different opinion on, on what you should do. So that was interesting to hear about that side of it and also to hear for him how it's changed now from as a player where he kind of felt the stress would really beat himself up, similar to me, to now as a manager, he's able to, to accept, I think, accept himself a lot better. So, yeah, you'll be able to, you'll be able to see as soon as it's out. Well, I'm very excited for that. And like you said, it's interesting, actually, you said it's Gareth Southgate's man that doesn't let media come into the camp or he doesn't let it. Because with the England women's team, you kind of found that as well with Savira Wiegman. You kind of saw that they weren't even infiltrated by the media in terms of nobody had their Twitter or nobody had the paper. And I feel like that's probably a good way going forward, especially when you're all in a camp together. And again, like you said, that's probably why now the camp is the way it is, because everybody's so tight in that little community for so many weeks. Um, And obviously, I want to bring this question up by Jay, because he said, uh, what is the best opposition player you've played against? Because obviously you've mentioned Moussa Dembele as someone you played with. Who would you say is someone that you stepped back and went, wow, your class? Yeah, uh, two for me, two sort of very different players. Um, Zlatan would definitely be one of them. Um, just, I mean, his speed was was quite incredible. So for, for someone as tall as he is, uh, I'd expect him to be obviously good in the air. I'd expect him to be strong technically. We know what, he, what he's about, but the speed really sort of surprised me. He was, he was very, very quick. Um, and then and then the other player for me, which I mean, twisted and twined me a few times, would be uh, Aguero. So mm. Aguero was just... He's one of those players always playing on the shoulder. Um, you, you know, the second you take your arm to look at the ball, you had, you know, David Silva then just playing the reverse pass. He's in, um, he's got that chop and chop. And, and, and when you give him a half a chance, he, he finishes it. So I would say them two, for different reasons, were, were arguably the hardest. And, um, and I, I would say probably just outside of that would be a Suarez, just because of the intensity that he pressed at. He was just for 90 minutes. So even if he scored four, he wants five, you know, and it's like when the ball's going out in the far corner and they're, they're four new up, he'll be chasing you down to get that ball to try and get a fifth. So he was always someone that you knew heading into the game, right? And I need to be prepared for him. Mm, definitely. I mean, I was going to say, when you when you say those players, when he's running at that sort of time on, with the time on the clock, you're thinking, wow, wait, he's got a different engine in him. Um, but no, it's really yeah. interesting to, to hear your take. Um, and obviously from... 
moving away from the Premier League and the leagues in England, you went, I'm going to forgive me if I pronounce it really badly, but Alan's four, you went across, Was it, it was Turkey, wasn't it? Um, it was Turkey, so how did yeah. you kind of find adjusting to a new country and a new league all at the same time? Uh, it came at a good time for me. So it came at a good time. I'd, um, well, I, I'd struggled in my personal life and, you know, football had, my football had been affected, you know, football eventually turned its back on me. It, it gave me a good few chances before it did that. So I, I can't have any complaints in that, in that respect. But um, when it had turned its back on me, I'd, I'd hit rock bottom. Um, I guess during that period, I learned to surrender and accept that actually the moments of playing for Tottenham, uh, playing for Liverpool um, for, at that moment in time had gone. And I just needed to get well, you know, get well as a, as a, as a human being, get well as a father, get well as a son and, and so on. Um, later, uh, in that period of getting well, the, the football then became back came back to the forefront. Um, I was always keeping fit and training, but that just helped me with my my mental health. And um, six months after going through that process and sort of you know reaching out to a lot of clubs, a lot of old teammates, trying to get opportunities, um, there were very few and far between. Uh, there was well, I think nearly seventy odd teams who sort of just said no, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the opportunity came to come to go to Turkey. So it was a trial. It was a 10 day trial. I flew over there. Uh, I don't know how this, the, the, the deal came around through a, a part time mechanic, part time agent. Um, it was completely random. And he, he introduced me to the manager who didn't speak a word of English, just was blowing smoke in my face through the translation. I understood that he said, you're a good player, but you need to prove it. Um, and uh, yeah, the 10 day trial and it just everything just just happened it just it just fell into place and um i felt at home i was living on a beach uh, which really helps um i uh, learned the new language so i decided that i'm i'm going to i'm going to learn turkish i had an idea in my head that i was going to stay there and build my career there so i did all of that and it was it was great for a period of time turkey was like amazing um and then afterwards i was kind of like right i feel ready to to come back now Mm, definitely. And I mean, if you don't mind me asking, how how did you manage to get to that place where you could go back to football? Was it just talking to friends and family, talking out sort of thing? Or was there something that you went down with through a route kind of thing for help? Yeah. So I tried rehab twice before. I tried at 19 and I tried at 24, but rehab didn't quite work for me. I wasn't ready. Um, so at the age of 26, when I, when I had that time out of football, what worked for me and what still works for me is AA. So I go to Al mm. Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Gamblers Anonymous. Uh, they're my sort of two primary addictions. Um, I got a sponsor, someone I could speak with on a daily basis. Uh, I started writing down a gratitude list. Um, yeah, all of these sort of like small steps just kind of gradually like rebuilt me. So I can't say it was like anything happened overnight, but it was just literally like a day by day process where I started to feel like, okay, I'm ready to go and play football now because I felt like I had unfinished business and I didn't want to tell my story of one of like pity because I felt mm -hmm. like, oh, if I tell my story now, I'll say, yeah, you're just crying about it because you've lost your career and lost your money and all that. So I thought, I want to talk from a position of strength. So that was kind of one of my big motivations to get back um, and, and yeah, and, and sort of like reestablish some, some credibility. No, definitely. And, and good on you for doing that because like you say, you could sit there and be like, I did this and this is where I am because of it. But you went out there and you went and fought for it. So I think that's obviously another big inspiration for other footballers that are kind of dealing with that at the moment. And obviously with that, we've obviously got Ivan Tony at the minute, which is who is obviously struggling. And would you say that would be the advice you kind of give to him? Or do you think he's kind of on the right tracks already? He's going to kind of realise what he needs to try and do to take the next steps. I'm not sure because I saw uh, an Instagram post the other day where he was showing that he was playing cards and stuff like that. So... <laughs> Like, if you asked me prior to that, I was, like, obviously really supportive of him and hoping that that he could obviously turn it around. But um, whether he has an issue or not, I don't know because I've never spoken to him. So um, not everyone is an addict. Like, some people mm -hmm. just have a bad habit um, that they need to obviously nip in the bud. Other people, like myself, um, are addicted to it and need, like, quite a lot more help. So, um, unfortunately, there's many people like myself um, and, and maybe like I, Ivan, I don't want to label him, but, but many people that obviously struggle with with the gambling inside football and outside football. Um, obviously, there's huge debates around the, the advertising and stuff like that. Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I mean, I have strong feelings about it, but I just don't see, uh, I don't really see any real change to it. I think, again, it's going to, it's going to be a, a, a slow process, but one that I'm definitely, um, you know, like very keen in, in voicing my opinions about.
Mm, Because that's the thing, because obviously you could say, oh, we'll stop um, shirt sponsors having it, this, that and the other. But we've seen that that doesn't necessarily work. And I don't want to ask you the question of what needs to be done, because I feel like, like you say, it's a very slow process. But what what would you say in your eyes is that maybe the first step of getting change? Well, I just think within football, it can be the communication. So I think a lot of the players struggle with the communication in terms of the trust, in terms of having someone to actually speak to that's then not going to use it against them and put them out of the team and, and all of that kind of stuff. So that's definitely within football. But but I don't just want to speak about the footballers because we're not the only ones who suffer, right? So the gambling adverts are not are not just there for the for the 22 players on the pitch. They're there for the 60,000 in the stadium and the millions back home on television watching it. So. Um, I would like to see it removed, um, and the reason why I'd like to see it removed is because I think it would it would be a, a really good statement from a, a football club, uh, the league, whoever it is who makes that first step. I would be like, well, okay, you know what? We we, we I, I would certainly feel heard, and I think it'd be a, a real positive step in terms of recognizing it as an issue. Because uh, for me, it's a it's it's a disease. Gambling is is a disease, mm-hmm. and. Um, uh, and I feel like we're, we're kind of feeding that as, as, as football clubs. And I think if we do that, that would be the start of, uh, of, of the healing process. But as you know, we both said, it's going to be a slow process. It's going to be a long process. But um, I just want to see us at least make a step in the right direction. Moving the sponsor from the middle of the shirt to the side of the shirt, uh, for me, doesn't change anything. You know, it, yeah. it's still there. And um, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, we, could talk, we could talk about it for, for, for longer than the hour, trust me. <laughs> Right, like, and like you say, it is like it's not an in, well, it is an interesting topic, but like you say, it's one that doesn't necessarily have an answer right this second. Because, like you said, like it's simple things like that isn't going to make a big difference. Um, but obviously, I want to talk about what you've been doing recently because obviously we've spoken a bit about Spurs, we've spoken a bit about um, obviously your struggles and things. But I want to know, and I think everybody else would want to know, what you're kind of doing now in your career. What's what's your kind of life after football, so to speak? Yeah, so I've just I've just left Wigan. Um, I'm not sure on my next steps in terms of playing. I uh, I think I'd probably like to play for for a little bit longer, but I, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure on that. I'm kind of like going through. Um, I don't. Know, I guess it's a transitional period where I'm kind of like reflected on on where I want to be in my life, and and I think a lot of it depends on what offer comes. So mm-hmm. um, that's that's kind of where I'm at in terms of in terms of playing, in terms of coaching. I'm doing my badges. I really want to be a manager. Uh, I want to start in non-league as a, as a first team manager and sort of work my way up. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work under a lot of top managers and also some not so good managers. And I've kind of learned like a little bit from all of them. So it's kind of like I would like to take that and add my own little twist, which will, which would be, um, like I said, for me, I'd start with communication because I just feel mm-hmm. communicate with your players, having that relationship, just get so much more out of them. Um, you know, I did an interview with Danny Rose actually with uh, Behind the White Lines, and and uh, he spoke about his time with Maurizio and just how he was a friend to him, you know, and it was just how meaningful his relationship was, and they wanted to play for him, and I, I think many players did, you know. Obviously, Spurs had such such huge yeah. success under him, um, and then and then and then lastly, I've got my um, my business, which is it's a Behind the White Lines, which is going to be the you know UK's first. Um, professional football uh, aftercare academy where we're going to be taking care of players from the ages of 18 to 21 as they as they transition so um the idea of, of the football side of it is if oh you know if they're late developers if they play better under certain coaches they'll then be picked up again and and and, and given an opportunity by a club uh, which would be great for them um and if they're not then it's 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 a transition but rather than a real harsh sort of like mm. bang you're out of football see you later it's a, it's a gradual transition. Um, we've got Rohamdi University here who very kindly offered free scholarships. We've got Roots to America. Um, we've got opportunities with, with the banks where they can go in and do sort of like um, for what, almost like job experience and they've mm-hmm. got apprenticeships there. So so lots going on, lots keeping me busy. Um, and I feel that I guess with it all, I have a, I, I find that I found that I've got a purpose and um, you know, that just really sort of like keeps me, keeps me well. Mm, definitely. And, and like you said, I think it's a really good thing you're doing because um Recently, I watched the was it the Crystal Palace documentary where you saw those young kids in academies and then they disappear. And it's like, well, what can they do with their life now? But like you said, we give you're giving them the platform where they can either carry on their football career under a coach or a manager that will nurture them or give them something else that they need or they go and find something else. And would you say that's something that you've always really wanted to do maybe? Or is it something that's happened as you've reflected through your career? Definitely something that's happened later on. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think during that period where I kind of, sort of left football and I had no identity and I didn't know what was next or where I was going. I think in that period there, that's what kind of 
gave me the experience and the taste of actually imagine what it's like for these boys at, you know 18 to 21 who can't just go to turkey because the guy you know is not going to be blowing smoke in his face and yeah i know you're a good player because he won't know that player mm-hmm. at that age so it's like well what do they do and they've spent over 50 percent of their life in the academy system you know these, these boys and girls get picked up from the age of eight some even younger um spend their whole time at one club get attached to that club and then sort of like what's next so mm-hmm. um as you know that it's a very small I mean, my very fortunate at Spurs to produce as many players as we did during that period and even since then I've, I've produced obviously a lot of good players but there's also players within our youth team who didn't make it and and what happened to them you know so um yeah I mean it's not my story to tell but I I know having stayed in contact with them that it that it wasn't always pretty Mm, no, and I think that sometimes that us as fans and, and maybe as other people, they, they think, actually, we don't really see that side of football. Um, and it's true what you said. We we kind of only see what happens on the pitch. And I think what we need to remember is that you're all human um, at stages in, in football. Um, but obviously, I also want to go back a bit. So you mentioned you played under lots of different managers. Who would you say is the one manager that you can say, right, I really liked working under you or a manager that you, I know you said you've taken bits from different ones, but is there one that really stands out for you in the way they play or the way they manage, the way they communicate? Yeah, I would say um, at the time, Brendan Rogers was probably the best one for me. Um, I said I was, I was very young and um, he, you know, he picked me up from the train station, showed me around Swansea, showed me like, you know, where I could stay in, you know, said to me anything you need and all that. So that, he, he really added that like personal touch. And I think that's so important, like especially when I was young, but at any age, to be honest with you, it's just it's just nice to to feel wanted, to feel that you have a relationship with the manager and that you 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 know you, you feel important. And um, mm-hmm. so he was someone who stood out for me. Obviously, played amazing football as well. Um, you know, going back, what was it now, twelve years ago, we were sort of playing. The only team that was playing that football was Arsenal. And as Swansea, we came up and kind of did it better for for a period of time. Um, and then obviously you've got your Man City and whoever else and Arsenal have come back to the forefront now. But but during that period, I mean, that season was just crazy. We beat Arsenal, we beat Man City, uh, we beat Liverpool. And it was like, so he was he was amazing to work under. Um, he also did, had a small taste of working under Jurgen Klopp. And that mm-hmm. was that was great. Just just sort of sort of learning from him tactically, learning just how intense he was. And, you know, the training was uh felt like all day every day I think for the first three months there was I didn't have one day off in the first three months it was it was it was really really intense um but again it's it's for me it's culture like you know, obviously different countries work in different ways uh different managers have different philosophies so it's, it's, it was nice to sort of experience all of that um and also got to work under Villas Boas so I had that year at Tottenham under Villas Boas as well and um yeah you know, he was probably I think probably the youngest manager that I've worked under and uh, again it was good to learn that you know the good and the bad from from him as well no, and like you say, it's, it's interesting because obviously where you've been at different clubs, you kind of pick up different traits and different things. And it's nice to hear, obviously, how Brendan Rodgers, although he could have been a Spurs manager, not so much anymore, how the way he played and the way he brought you guys up. So it is really interesting um, to hear that. And I just want to ask as well, obviously, with your football career, now looking back on it, was it everything it kind of lived up to? Or do you think there was other things that it could have done for you, if that makes sense? Is it is it what you lived up to? Mm, no, 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 it wasn't, no. I, I, but mostly down to me, I think, because I said, I, I, I feel, if I'm honest with myself, that I wasted opportunities. Um, you know, I was at Tottenham that year, I played 28 games for Tottenham, or 27, something around that. And uh, Daniel Levy offered me a new four-year deal at the time, as, as you know, I was, I was one of the youngest players in, in the team. And, um, I just felt, no, I wanted to play 48 games that year. I wanted to play Europa League, I wanted to play the FA Cup, I wanted to play everything. So having played only 28 games, in my head, it's it's not enough, you know? Um, when clearly today, if you see a 20-year-old playing 28 games for Tottenham, you're like, he's doing well, it's enough, he's going to have a good future. But I just I just couldn't see it. And um, I lacked patience. Um, I... I felt that, you know, I didn't feel that the manager liked me, uh, Villas Boas at the time, which again, was mostly in my own head. And um, and I rushed and I, and I pushed through a move to, to go to Cardiff. And um, don't get me wrong, it was amazing to go there and captain a Premier League team. That was just, it was just amazing. And um, it was unfortunate that Malcolm Mackay got sacked halfway through the year and we ended up getting relegated. But but up until that stage, we were doing really well. Um, so I've had great moments, played in the Olympics, played for England, captain Sierra Leone right now. Um, so I've definitely had moments I look back on fondly, but I, I can't help but 
feel uh, an element of regret that you know I uh, I wasted some some really good opportunities. Mm. And uh, it is like you say, it's quite annoying to sit back and be like, if I just had that bit of patience. But like you said, I think that sometimes with me as well, you can't you can't always rush things. You've got to wait back and and settle for those things to happen. And um, but like you said, you still got loads of of great moments. And obviously, captain in Sierra Leone, that must be incredible as well. Yeah, it is. It's very, very different from playing for England. I assure you, it's very, very different. So when I first turned up, um, I went to the kit man. He's just got one medium-sized kit, which doesn't fit a man who's six foot four. Um, I was like, I was so embarrassed. I was like, I'm not going down for dinner when it looks like I've got like a crop top on. So that oh was my. like, that was <laughs> like to get some other jumper, put this other jumper on and, and go downstairs. And I never took that jumper off for the whole week, right? Um, we had to... Wash, wash our own kit. Uh, there was no, there was no physio, uh, all that kind of stuff. So, like, I remember just like getting the soap, washing the kit in the sink, and hanging out to dry. Just thinking, I've never actually experienced that. It's very humbling, but I've never like experienced any of this stuff. Obviously, a lot of the, the boys who play for Sierra Leone are home based and and they live mm -hmm. there, or that, or they definitely grew up there. So, uh, that was like almost a, a shock to the system, but. Um, it's, it's all fun, you know, like, I, I can't say that, oh, any of the moments I'm like, well, I mean, there are, the, the, the flights and the journey is sometimes a challenge, right? But um, for me, it's it's very meaningful, you know, like when I go uh, to play in Sierra Leone and and um, and we see all the people there and what it means to them and uh, you walk around the villages and everyone knows you. I mean, they don't have a television, right? But they know your name. They've, they've been to see you on, on like, they, they show all the games on Facebook Live. So they, they know who you are. They're, they're football fanatics. And it's like, it's great to mean something, you know, it, it definitely has a purpose, um, but it's challenging. You know, my, my family know when I'm there for 10 days, like my phone is nonstop with dealing with all the different matters there. Um, and it's more than just being a captain. It's, it's you know, taking care and organising a lot of, a lot of something. But I want to build and I, and I, I, I don't shy away from, from a challenge. No, that is, I mean, that's amazing uh, to hear the crop top uh, story. I mean, Carl's still wetting himself about that. <laughs> so, um, but no, it's, it's interesting to see how, like you say, that you're the captain of the team, but it's almost like you're playing with like a kit man that doesn't do the washing and stuff like that. Like it's, it's incredible to think that that's a national team. Um, yeah. But again, it shows the camaraderie as well, because I, I suppose what you kind of missed in the England camp in terms of at that young age, you've now kind of got it in abundance with Sierra Leone. Exactly, exactly. And we have, and we are, we are continuing to make changes. So we now have a kit man who washes kit, who has, nice. you know, everything <laughs> from Excel down to small. Uh, you know, we have a physio, we have a doctor, uh, we have food and it's organised, you know what I mean? So, so we are making progress and, uh, you know, I, I definitely feel pride in being a part of that. But, um, but without doubt, like you mentioned, the camaraderie is, is great. You know, everyone's there together. It's not about uh who has the best watch or car or you know has it it's sometimes being changed there's no ego there you know it's it's uh it's really it's a really humbling sort of place to be no it really sounds it and obviously you've spoken a lot about um growing up young with the footballing um thing and the, the kind of I guess you said it wasn't a lot of money playing in those leagues but obviously for a young kid like as you were that was quite a lot of money so do you think that's something that hinders players now as in We've seen players that have got a high ceiling and then with the money injection, it just kind of all falls a, a little bit apart. Would you say that's something that, that players of today kind of struggle with, especially where wages are seemingly going up and up and up as each year comes? Um, it's an interesting debate. Like I, I can see I can see why people ask that question. Um, and I would say there will be obviously some cases where it goes to their head and they spend silly and, uh, you know, they'll go and buy a Ferrari or this or spend it. 20,000 in a nightclub and stuff. There are obviously cases of that happening, but I would say, um, I, I would say a lot of the players earn their money. And the, and the re and I know that set mouth may sound mad to, to fans and stuff. I, I know because I know it's, it's such a big debate, right? But these youngsters who are coming through, right? Like it's the going, it's the going rate. So if you're like a, a top banker or you're uh, a top musician, they don't cut your wages because so well, you're, you're a bit young. Like if you're doing the job, and you're doing the job to a certain level it's like that's what the market rate is so it's kind of like um they earn that money uh, what they do with it hope you know there are so many obviously so many support systems in place now in terms of financial advisors uh families are becoming more educated in terms of knowing that their children need to protect their money and put it into certain places so um and i would also say which which kind of doesn't really get mentioned 
there's so much good that the players do with the money, mm. like so much good. So I know what everyone was talking it mostly comes from the Sun newspaper or the Daily Mirror, or whatever, where they're like, this player earns X amount. And it's like, well, he does. But in England, you've got 45% tax. That, that mm. you know, after, after that 45% is taken away, he then gives X amount to charity. Um, you know, you mentioned Craig Bellamy. Um, so you know, we thought about uh, Craig Bellamy um, to, to mention him. He, he He's someone who, uh, you know, obviously just declared bankruptcy, right? But he's someone who, um, you know, built an academy uh, for over, over a million pounds in, in Sierra Leone, you know? So a lot of players are very generous with their money and put it in the right places. Rashford's another great example. So, um, yeah, I, I've said it's a debate. I, I can I can understand from both sides, but uh, just my personal thing is it's the market rate, and mm. um, and 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 yet where else would it go? It would go back into the owner's pocket. So I'm, I'd rather see the player have it. Yeah, no, that is a fair enough comment. I suppose us as fans, we don't really think of it like that, and it sounds awful. And I know I've already spoken about it tonight and about how you are human, but I suppose we don't look at it like that and it is awful to think of that. So thank you for opening our eyes, so to speak, to that kind of way of, of thinking. Um, and obviously I want to ask you a few more questions in terms of your time at Tottenham. And I don't want to repeat myself because I know I'll, I'll ask the same questions, um, but you obviously mentioned Jermaine Defoe. And for me, I really look up to Jermaine because like you said about players and things, he does a lot uh, for people. So from obviously working with Jermaine, um, what are your like thoughts of working with? Because obviously he was a massive striker when I was growing up, and I loved watching him. Um, what what are your kind of takes of playing with him? He's a big kid. He's a big <laughs> kid. That's how that's how I that's how I think of him. Even today, I still think of him as that. You know, like he's he was older than me, but at the same time younger than me. You know, like uh, he's he's got such a such a nice like bubbly personality. Um, in terms of a player, I mean, yeah, just incredible. He had this amazing ability to just touch it and as soon as you move your leg bang through the legs and it's across the goalkeeper in the back of the net and so many of his goals were obviously scored like that and, and even in training it was all, you, I knew it was coming but he still was able to do it and it's a bit like Lennon if you, if you look at you know Aaron Lennon and you look at what he did right every time everyone knew he's going to touch it in touch it in go down the line and cross it but he was successful at it and I think to be successful at it knowing because all the analysis that goes into games right into free games Everybody knows what he's going to do. The left back would have been told 500 times heading into the game, this is what he's going to do. But most, or 99% of players couldn't stop him. So it's like, um, to have played with such talented players, Gareth Bale as well, um, he was just amazing that season. So um, we had a really good squad, you know, full of really good characters. Jan Vertonghen, great. Uh, Brad Friedel, you know, the dad of the group. He was, he was like, he was always like the senior figure. Um, Hugo came in that year as well. So, no, so many good players, good people as well. Um, and a lot of, a lot of whom you know, I still, I still keep in contact with today. Oh, nice. I mean, I forget that Hugo joined in that season as well. Just to yeah. think that he's still there now. Um, it's a madness. Um, but Stephen, I don't want to drag it out more than I need to. It's been a pleasure having you on tonight. I'm so honoured to to have a player on that I, I watched as a kid. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to you. Uh, can you tell everybody, obviously, where they can find um, behind the white lines and obviously where they can find your interview well when it comes out with Gareth Southgate and Danny Rose yeah sure so um, on Instagram it's behind the white lines official um, you can see like keep up to date regularly with all of my stuff on um, on LinkedIn so which is just my name Stephen Corker I'm, I'm regularly on there sort of sending updates and um and yeah, and it's good that the, the interview will be out soon with Southgate. You can watch the Danny Rose one and, and many more players to come. So uh, thank you for obviously giving me the, the, the platform tonight to, uh, to share my story. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. No, thank you. Like I say, it's, it's been it's been a dream of mine to get someone on that I watched when I was younger and then to have you on and to ask you all the questions and about your career and stuff. It's, it's been amazing. Um, a thank you to everybody uh, that's watching now, that's been live, that's been tuning in or that's re-watching now. Thank you very much. Uh, Holly Sox says live will be back next week. We'll be talking about, uh, obviously, signings and stuff that's been going on at Spurs. And like I say, like we always say, come on you Spurs. 